right, I'd like to welcome you all to this rescheduled Wednesday talk um, hosted by Kirsten Bosch and Straight Nature. And just before we start, just a word from our sponsors. Uh, Straight Nature is the leading specialist natural history publisher in Southern Africa and is associated with the best selling and most highly regarded field guides in the region. Straight Nature publishes full color illustrated books across a variety of subject areas, including birds, mammals, reptiles, trees and flowers, as well as the marine environment, geology, astronomy, general wildlife, and children's nature. And their book, their, all of their books are available at the, either online or at the Kirsten Bosch bookshop. And then from myself, I'm Brett from Room to Grow. Um, we're an exterior design and project management company that's been designing and creating outdoor living spaces in and around Cape Town since 2002. And we offer a complete suite of landscape design, construction, and associated um, exterior design elements to our residential, commercial, and retail clients. And you can find out more about us at roomtogrow.co.za or follow us on our socials, Facebook and Instagram. And then I'm very grateful and very uh, privileged to introduce uh, Professor Ansi Dipanoskuman. She's a retired arachnologist and one of the foremost experts on African spiders. As project manager of the South African National Survey of Arachnida, SANSA, she was involved in sampling, documenting, identifying, and describing the, spina, the spider flora and fauna of South Africa. This resulted in the publication of the first spider atlas and the assessments of all South African spiders for the first IUCN red list for threatened spider species. After her retirement, she continued to be heavily involved in SANSA activities such as publications, the SANSA newsletter and student identifications. Her research over a period of 55 years has resulted in more than 300 published titles, including nine books and 60 online photo identification guides to South African spider families and species. She was involved in the description of 43 new spider species and her colleagues, colleagues have named 38 species and four genera after her. She spends a lot of time to promote spiders through papers, posters, talks, and the SANSA newsletter. And we're very grateful and privileged to have her with us again today, here today. And just a note that if you have any questions, please feel free to add those to the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end of the talk. And without further ado, Ansi, thank you so much and over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning to everybody. Before we really start to talk about spiders and I discuss the book, I would like to tell you where we obtain all this information. A group of South African arachnologists started in 23 years ago with a new project and we call it the South African National Survey of Arachnida. And the main aim was to discover, describe and to make an inventory of all the arachnid faunas in South Africa. Now the core team members is myself, Professor Charles Harder, University of the Free State, Professor Stefan Foot, University of Venda, Dr. Leon Lodz, National Museum, he's also now retired, and Mrs. Robert Love of the ARC. Now there are actually four phases for Sansa. The first one was to consolidate all the data. We need to work through all the published records and to decide how many species are described from South Africa. The second phase was when SANBI became involved, we received funding from NORAD and we can really start surveying the country. The third phase was when we really was able to produce uh, products, the first spider atlas 2010 and the first spider red list in 2020 and a lot of new species have been described. We at the moment in phase four, a lot to do with awareness, we produce identification guides, updated checklists and the research continue. If we look at the species in South Africa, it all started here in the 1700s up till now and during the periods 1900 to 1920, 32 percent of our species have been described. Then there was some decline and then when we started with Sansa here at the end you can see we contributed to 25 percent of the species. 
Only for interest, I've worked through the list, and it seems as if this hedgehog spider, Pycnoconda tribulus, is probably one of the oldest spiders described from South Africa. That was done by Fabricius in 1781. All this information we have on the species, we need to consolidate it into a database. We develop a MYSQL relational database at ARC. You can see here at the bottom, the people that was involved in, the, the, in developing the database. And at the moment, the database contained more than 2,000, 200,000 uh, records in the collection. It was a big story, Sansa. We received the funding from the, the NORAD, NORAD from the Norwegian Developing Agency, and there was a launch and the ARC, you can see the CEOs of ARC in Sandy signing the contract, and we had a steering committee, and even at one stage the people from Nor Nor the Norwegian people visit the, the, the research institute. Then we sit down to do a gap analysis. With, uh, you can see the map, and we have to work out a plan where to survey, and where, we, where are no surveys needed and who's going to do what over the, the period of time. Then there was different teams. Here you can see the Free State team, the IRC team, there's the vendor team with Stefan, and there's a lot of people in the Free State, Charles Haddad, and then we also had a lot of people, public people and research managers that get involved. Linda Wiese, for instance, she sampled in the Eastern Cape, and she sampled the Adel National Park, and we also published articles on Teichpunt in Jeffrey Spy. We're at the moment busy with Bobby Hans Club. Elton Leroux, he, we, he sampled in Ograbi's uh, National Park, Montebok National Park, and at Kirstenbos. And then Peter Webb, you'll see his name very frequently on the photos. He sampled all our files. He's an excellent photographer and an excellent collector. So he has made enormous contribution towards Sansa. Now, spiders are everywhere. They're not found on, in small areas. You find them on the ground, in the grass, on the trees, everywhere. So we have worked out a Sansa protocol, how to sample them. We use pit traps, active search, sweeping, beating, litter sifting, vacuuming, canopy fogging, and winglet extraction. So now where did we get all this data from for the 2,300 species? It was with Sansa surveys, as we've mentioned now, reserve managers. Here you can see the late Zani van der Waal. He was one of the first reserve man managers to contact me. He was working in the hell, Swartberg Nature Reserve, and we published on that reserve. Johan Heisemann is only one of the examples of the people of the, the garden route that contact us and sample for us. Here goes a lot of people. The, most of the people here have sampled the spiders for us, and a lot of them have also taken photographs. And then the student projects, we will, we will talk to that. The student projects. We were involved in more than 50 student projects. The people, the students have projects that look at different aspects of the environment. And then all the spiders form part of the project and all the material of been housed in the National Collection of Arachnida or it was in the National Museum at Bloemfontein. Most of the identification work was done by myself and uh, uh, Charles Haddad and Leon Lords. And we, from this student project, more than 145 uh, publications have been published on spiders. We sit with a lot of spiders. Here you can see two rooms at the ARC. We call them the, the, the room full of spiders. All the spiders were neatly sorted of every area in containers. There you can see for all that containers is, is for example, spiders that were sampled in the Maluti project as part of Michelle Hammer's project. Yeah, Cedarburg, over the five year period, they sampled 17 localities in Cedarburg and on a monthly basis we receive this big containers full of pit full trap spiders. But all these spiders need to be sorted, put in bottles and labeled. This is the team of uh, ladies at the ARC that was involved with this activity. And there you can see Robin Lyon, Robin, Robert Lyle behind the microscope. After the species are identified, they get a label, put in bottles into the collection, and it is data-based. 
So everything is on a database. You can easily track a record. Here you can see how the increase in the number of, of, of specimens in the national collection since we started with Sansa. Now we get to the photographers. Unfortunately, I do not have photos of all the photographers, but all the, most of the photographers shown here have not only taken photos, but they also collected the specimens for us. What is very important for Sansa is that we eventually need to have a voucher specimen in the collection. Here, I want to mention three people especially. This is the late uh, Peter Webb, I already say six, more than 60% of the photos in the new spider book was uh, taken by Peter. And then also, unfortunately, I don't have a good photo of Alan Jones, but you'll see a lot of webs that were taken by Alan. He lived at Klokkelaan in the Free State, and he took amazing photos of the web. And then the Vida van der Waal, she's known by everybody for her Saltisidae photos. And also, uh, she's an excellent photographer. That is only to mention a few. Now we sit with a wealth of information. There are 72 families, 490 genera, 2,300 species. This is an example of uh, the first atlas that was published in 2010. We are lucky, hopefully, before the end of the year to, uh, to be able to publish an updated checklist of the spiders. Uh, this atlas can be, later I'll give you the, the link where it can be downloaded from. Now, 52% of the species that we found in South Africa are endemic to South Africa, and we still have more than 100 that are already uh, given a name that need to be described in the near future. If we look at the conservation status, 64% of our species are least concerned. They've got a wide distribution, now not threatened. 30% of the species are data deficient. Either we only have one of the sexes or we have only one of two from a very small area. So we need to do more collecting in areas. 6% of the species have been identified of special concern. They are rare though. Some of them are threatened, some of them are vulnerable and we need to, we are able now to look at them more closely. With all this information we've got and with all the photos we've got, we were able to produce a few books, and some of the books, like the, the Grassland book and the, the Mulemorph book, the Kalahari book, Savannah book, and even the posters are still available from the ARC. This is the first field guide, and now we have a follow up of the new field guide. And that is what everything is all about today. Now, the new field guide are divided into different sections, and we have the web dwellers and the wanderers, because not all the spiders make webs. And the wanderers you can divide in plant dwellers and the ground dwellers. And for each of these sections, we provided a quick key to all the families, for instance, that are web dwellers, and all the families that are plant dwellers or ground dwellers. And for each of them, we provided a family account, something on the genus, the species, the scientific name, the common name, Afrikaans, English, a map, and a short species description, conservation status, and a photo. Important characters. To be able to identify spiders, the people frequently find spiders and they want to identify it. But spiders are enormous diverse. The 72 genera that you get, and even I would say the 490, uh, oh, sorry, the 490 genera you get is probably each of them have special features that you need to look at to be able to identify them. Things that we look at is the body shape, the color, body size, eyes, and then of course the genitalia. Here's an example of a male pulp and the epigyne is very important because this is what you need to be able to identify the species level, the legs, the tarsal claws, the setae, the spinnerets, the behavior. That is actually to name a few of the important characters for spiders. But I would like to show you how diverse they are. Here you can see the uh, uh, crab spiders. We got, uh, sorry, I did something wrong. There you can see six of the genera of the crab spiders. And here you can see the eye patterns, how completely 
all the eye patterns differ from the one as a genus to the another. And this, this will be the same for all of the different genera of crab spiders. Here you look, you can see the uh, uh, days, the body shape. Here you can also see the different genera, how everybody, every each of the genera are completely different from each other, all different shape and sizes and color. Another important thing is that uh, the size of the spiders between males and females differ. You get the pattern spider. Here you can see the male are much smaller than a female. The golden orchid spider. Here you can see again the male much smaller. With the crab spiders, they do males on the abdomen of the female. They're waiting to see who will be the lucky one to mate with her. And then you get the sophisticated days. Here's a female and a male, completely different. If you don't know they're the same species, you will think it's you've got two different species here. And the velvet spiders here, also the male and the female, how they differ in, in shape and size. Now, what makes spiders so unique? First, the ability to produce silk, the ability to produce venom, and especially they have amazing camouflage skills. You just don't see them. If we look at the silk, the silk are produced in the abdomen in different glands. Each of the, the glands produce a different type of silk, and the silk are released by the gland and move with the duct to the and it is, it is pulled out usually with the legs from the spinnerets through the spigots, and when they are pulled, they align to form a thread. So it's a fluid that become a thread. Here you can see the spinnerets with the spigots on the tip there, and each of them will release a silk thread. The cribulated silk, this is slightly a different type of silk. A few of the families produce cribulated silk. It's very curly. It's not a wet. They don't have any glue, but they, due to their structure, they can, the, the insects are very easily catch in them. There you can see the spinnerets, the cribellum, and with the special setae, calamistrum on the hind leg, the, the silk are being pulled out of the, the, the spinnerets. Now, the daily use of silk, all the spiders use silk, although not all the spiders use silk to build webs, but on a daily basis, all the spiders need silk. Here you can see one of the old web spiders here, you can see the spinnerets in action, and it's really bands of silk can be pulled out by, of the spinnerets to cover this prey. They make retreats, egg sacs, disperse, mate, and a mold, drop lines, guidelines, spray handling, and then the group that make their webs. Now, this is some of the, the retreats they make. This is a, a typical a trapdoor spider. Here you can see the very neat burrow lined with a layer of silk close by a trapdoor. This is an igloo from the Zodari day. This is also stones that are stick together with silk for the spider to hide in. This is one of the box spur uh, webs. You can see that there's a tube underneath there, and the spider used that to hide in and look like a box spur. Here is Altissidae. I've made a very neat silk nest in, in grass. Here's a crab spider that you also use silk to make this nest in grass. Then you get some of them, like the Sudari Day, that make a, a tube. They, they, they weave all the grasses together to make a tube to live in. And here you can see how dried grass are used to make a retreat. Exacts. Also, again, all the exacts, every <laughs> all the genera have different shapes and sizes. This is a very typical one of the rain spider. I think a lot of people have seen this in the vege vegetation. Usually, the female will will look after the exact until the babies hatch. There's one of the crab spiders that attach the exact to a, a, a leaf until the babies hatch. This is a very interesting shape of a ling spider. And then there's also with all the other eggs, and also a lot of mother care. The spitting spiders, the sky turtles, will carry the egg sacs attached to their mouth part. This is the nursery web 
below their bodies. Then you get also the, the wolf spiders attached to the spinnerets, the daddy long leg attached from in the mouth parts, and here is the pelican spider that attaches to their hind legs. Now we get to ballooning. This is how the spiders disperse. A lot of spiders get out of the egg sac and they're all together for a while and then they need to find their own way. What happened here? The spiders stand on tiptoe with the abdomen in the air and with the help of wind silk are being pulled out of the abdomen and then they let go and they are really carried for kilometers up in the air. I think a lot of people have seen this silk thread passing there and it's probably spiders ballooning. Here you can see now the, the, the action of standing on tiptoe, waiting to, to release the silk. Images, but there's even adults. This is an adult, the 30 day, that Vida photograph that I want to. Okay, I've done something wrong again. Now, how they uh, now how they shed their skin and mold. Here you can see one of the silver fly spiders. They attach this the, the old skin and then they are able to pull their body out of the or all the legs out of the old skin. Here's one of the crab spiders where the male have tried to <laughs> immobilize the female before hatching. And here you can see the action also during the mating period, depending on silk. Important here to mention is that, this, that all the spiders need to make a sperm web and they deposit the sperms on the sperm, sperm web and then, then they pick that up with their male dogs. I do. Then there's drop lines and drag lines. Here you can see, I think this year, I think most of the people have also probably see this, uh, that that spider is dropped down from wherever they are. Here you can see one of the crab spiders uh, feeding on a fly. They typically do that hanging on a silk thread while feeding. There's also some of the, the, the guidelines. And uh, here you see some of the silk is using also the, the, the guidelines. We always tell the children, we bungee jumping now, but spiders are already bungee jumping for years. Prey handling. They use the silk to cover their prey off the cage, especially the web dwellers. Here you can see enormous large prey are being caught and they can really damage the web. So it's very quickly the spiders will cover the, 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 the prey with silk to prevent any da more damage to the web. Here you can again see the activity of the spinnerets and the release of the bands of silk. And also here, it's like clean wrapping. They keep their food nice and clean. Now we get to the web dwellers. Only 25 of the spider families make a web. So not all the spiders, only 25 families make a web. Now there's all different kinds of webs. You get your funnel web, your signal web, your retreat web, your gum foot web, your sheet web, and your orb web, to name a few. Now this is a early morning in the free state when Alan Jones went for a walk. And here you can see the amazing lot of spiders around. During the day, you won't see them. You can't see the webs in daylight. It's usually only when it's misty or rainy that you can see this. And this is really very commonly found. Even here at Gauteng, Peter Webb have taken photos to show you the high number of spiders that are present in the gra grasses. Now, some of the webs, the funnel web, this is, also you only see it early in the morning, usually close to the ground. And here you can see they've got a funnel here and, and a sheet and anything that land on the sheet, the spider will come out, grab it and pull it back into the, in the funnel. The signal web, here you can see the signal threads and the tube and the spider, anything that touch these lines, the spider will move out. It's like a jack in the box, enormous force. They will move out, grab and pull back. And what also helped, they got three pair of legs to the front and only one to the back. And that helped the movement back into the tunnel, funnel, in the tunnel part of the web. 
the retreat web, there's a lot of retreat webs, there's a, a nest usually, and a lot of silk threads, silk threads around the retreat that we called a retreat web. This is the gunfoot webs. Here you can see it's almost like fishing. They have this stone nest and silk uh, and threads with a sticky droplets at the bottom, and any, anything that run on the ground and touch that line are being housed up so they are fishing. For the, and here you can see the spider in action, and it's usually ants that they catch that way. Then there's a lot of sheet webs. Some of them are hammock shaped, some of them are dome shaped, or some of them are flat, but a large, a large number of these sheet webs are also found in the grasses. Now we get to the orb webs. The 7% of our spiders make orb webs. This is usually the type of web that most people have already seen and especially the family Araneidae of 110 species that make this web are very commonly seen and known by people. Also here again, the orb webs are not all the same. They're different, different behavior. You've got your garbage line spot, the tropical tent web, the stonies, the missing sector, the triangle web, the single line, the boilers, and the throw web. Usually we talk about the common orb webs, and then we get an adapted orb web. This is an adapted orb web, and then you get a reduced orb web. This is a reduced orb web, and the boilers. This is what, uh, close up to show you one of the garbage line spiders. It's really a beautiful web they make. And the spider will stay there in the middle of the web in line with all the garbage. Here you can see the spider and the color of the spider is very much the same as the garbage. It's only when you blow on that part that the, when the spider moves that you realize that, that there's actually a spider in the web. The tropical tent web. This is adapted orb web, it's really actually orb web, completely different position. And here also there's some barrier webs at the top and a lot of flying insects land in here and then they eventually land on the web here. There's the egg sacs. Here is after the smaller webs that uh, of the images spiders have made. And this is how the spider look that live in this tropical tent web. The stony spiders, you get here, the spiders also, the whole angle is now not, uh, is now horizontal. And you get an area here that are covered with stones, leaves sometimes, and with silk. And there's the web. So any, anything that land in, and with some of the research have shown us that the second in-store uh, jumpers of the locusts frequently are caught by the spider. And this is one of the spiders there. You can see another one of the nests. Then we get to our beautiful uh, uh, spiders that are active during the day. A lot of the spiders are not active during the day. They make the webs and they remove the webs early in, in the morning and make a ne next one the next day. But there's a lot of spiders that are active in the web during the day. And this is usually the spiders that the people frequently see. And this is our golden orb web spiders. They are from some of our largest. I think this uh, Gumasi, uh, the filler is probably one of our largest uh, orb web spiders. And there are really some very beautiful spiders, the red leg and the, the banded leg. And you can see the webs have a, a yellowish color. Another very common one is the garden orb web spiders. You can see all different scallops and patterns on the abdomens that are also in the web. This one especially was at one stage very common in gardens, but probably maybe due to all the pesticide use, a lot of the people don't see them that frequently anymore. Then we get our kite spiders, some beautiful spiders. We call this the wings, and here you can see the, how the shape differ between the different species, shorter, very long ones. And this is the box uh, guide spiders with some beautiful patterns and different shape and sizes. But with all this, you can see the diversity in shape and sizes between the different species. Now the hedgehog spider again. This is completely a reduced orb web. There's a lot of moss flying around, but there are different 
difficult to catch in the normal opi because of the scales that get loose and the moth escape. So a number of spiders have developed special strategies to catch this moth. So this hedgehog spider, they make a trapezium web like that, and at night they hang with their legs open, they release a pheromone to attract moths, and then the moths are catch. The same with the boola spider. Here you can see the spider. With, uh, they make a thread with a sticky droplet. This one got two droplets, and they swing their legs around, and they hit uh, flying moths and insects at night. We've got three beautiful species, the Akarmani, the Beri, and Longipes, out in South Africa. Now, interesting also with the orbib spiders, they decorate their webs. There's a lot of different theories about uh, the decorations. Um, probably the, the spider will look larger like this, and this will be, provide some protection that birds don't fly through it. So there's all kinds of, of, of opinions about that. Here you can see one of the Australis spider with bands of silk trying forming a stabilimentum on the web here. Very interesting, Peter Webb discovered this one. He looked at the spider and the next thing he see the bottom of the spider. And then he was able to realize that they left small slits here in the web and that allowed them to move from the front to the back very quickly. Then we get the fro, fro webs of the Dinopidae. The spiders, were few, most of them have this very large eyes. They have all kinds of nobles on their bodies. And when they rest on plants, they look like a piece of bark. And then at night, they will make this, they have this long front legs, and, this, and they make their web, and then they enlarge the web, and this is then thrown over their prey. The Tetrachnatidae, the silver fly spiders, some of them are really very really beautiful, colored gold, red, and, and yellow. A lot of them also here, the web have, a lot of their webs have changed from vertical to more horizontal. And the big jawed Tetrachnatidae, water spiders, they frequently make their orb webs over water and they prey on uh, mosquito larvae that escape from the water. Liburidae, this is a, a cribulated silk. And here you can see the single, single line. The, sp the spider keep the line like this. And, and, uh, and when anything land on the silk here, he will, she will let go of the silk thread. And with this silk, it will entangle the prey. So that was all the web developers. You can see the more delicate spiders, longer legs. And uh, now we get to the ground dwellers. The ground dwellers are usually, they blend in the, with the environment. I hope you are able here to see this spider, yeah, one of the, uh, the wolf spiders. They on the ground, they're extremely well camouflaged. And here we get also different kinds. You get the border dwellers, the rock dwellers, the freshwater dwellers, the intertidal dwellers, Sand dwellers. We've got 32 families, 44% of our spiders are ground dwellers. So quite a large number, almost half of our spiders are ground dwellers. They make the butter dwellers. Here you can see all the different shapes and sizes of the webs of the butters they make. It's a very good place for a spider to live. Usually it's lined with silk, and then they usually frequently close it with all kinds of trapdoors. You can see a corklet, a thicklet. There they only use silk here, there they use their abdomen to close it. And it gives a lot of protection. And even when they close that, lid is close fitting and it protects them against prey and even things like drought. And even I think when there's a lot of, of, of uh, rain, that will, that will protect them. Of our common butter dwellers are, is probably our baboon spiders. Here's only one example, the golden baboon. The Genodi golden baboon spider, our big, biggest large spiders. Here you see the spider in its, its burrow. They usually don't close it with a trapdoor. Here you can see their front legs. It's like thick pads, velvety pads. And we think, we speculate, 
that maybe because the, and in South Africa they are called baboon spiders, that because this looked like a finger of a baboon. Trapdoor spiders, also in the burrows, here you can see the silk line and the, and, and the thick door. Here you can see a small uh, holes in the door. And the spider female has special seat on her leg there. And she used that to pull the door closed. And it's really impossible to open the door when she's inside. You can see they don't have a lot of hair because they permanently live in the burrow. And, and the, the absence of hair help them with movement in the in the burrow. An interesting burrow dweller is for instance the shield bump trapdoor spider. You can you can see that dome and it looks like a, if it's cut through, it's like as a proppy. They they put it up there, it look like a, to close the burrow down. And here again you can see between the different species how the shape and the hairiness differ of this shield of the abdomen. Box spider here you can see the burrow, the female live in the burrow, and there's the top, the top part we see here. Anything that touch this area is here, the spider will lift up the flap, grab the prey and pull it into the burrow. This is how the female look. <clears throat> the male is more active running around looking for a female and they frequently resemble velvet ants or you know, different other insects. The rock dwellers, a lot of them blend in with the color of the rocks. They're frequently flat and they're able to move into narrow spaces. There's the Selenopidae, <coughs> the wall spiders, Trochanteridae, all the, the, yeah, all very flat spiders. The fresh water dwellers, there's different ones that you find with the water. The very uh, uh, best known one is probably the fish eating spider. Nila species, here you can see one of the, uh, uh, the Nila species that have called himself a fish. They live next to fresh water. They will sit on the water, run over the water. And if they see anything eatable, they will dive down and grab the fish or the tadpole or whatever they found in the water. Here you can see one of the Lycusi, uh, of the Lycusidae wolf spiders, <coughs> a pirata species here. The photos was taken. Uh, 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 you, you can see the female that she dived down into the water. She collected a bubble of, of around her body with, with, and she are able to use that to breathe. <coughs> the intertidal spiders are found that the rocky coast areas, uh, Renata have taken this photo, and the empty limpet shells the spider used to hide in. So this spiders, uh, this Africana and Diasis spiders they are both covered by seawater every day. And the float out will come out and look for prey. So they live, you find them is in the tidal spiders next to the coast. A lot of spiders are found on the ground. One very interesting one is the Amoxinidae. This uh, genus are only found in Southern Africa, and they are specialist termite feeders. There's a lot of work being done on them in South Africa. And here you can see a female. They are able to dive down very quickly underneath the sand. There's one of the Sudhoridae that also have similar behavior to be able to dive down. Then, then you get um, the six-eyed crab spiders, here you can see the spider, and they use, here they use their legs to cover themselves with sand. Now we get to the colorful, beautiful plant dwellers. Here you get your grass dwellers, your bark dwellers, your foliage dwellers, and your flower dwellers. Here you can see one of the grass, the moon aises, on the grasses. And again, all, the, all different sizes and shapes, and a lot of them have long bodies. A lot of them are, are more fawn colored. They use, they build all kinds of nests in the, in the plants. Here you can see one of the, the Rincinia made the nest in the, in, the, uh, in the grasses. So they're completely adapted to live in grass. The bark spiders, it's also a lot of Tumisi there. You can see all different uh, size and shapes. Here, um, one of the Oxyurpita, you can see this tubicle on the abdomen looking like a thorn. And the Hasselidae, the long spinet bark spiders, they live permanently on trees. But again, you can see how they blend in 
with their surroundings. The foliage dwellers, they're usually a more green colored. This, for instance, this uh, Oxetata species, we found a lot of them in avocado and macadamia orchards where they lived on the plants and feed, feed on a lot of different insects. Flower dwellers are more brightly colored. And here in the Tumisidae, Tumises, this genus, they are able to change color. But you find them white and yellow or and pink but not like a chameleon, a quick change. It usually takes a few days before they are able to change. There you can see one a male, male that was lucky and busy mating. But you can see they're all brightly colored spiders to blend in with, with their surroundings. After talking about the skills of, of, of camouflage, all the spiders you see here actually made an orb web during the day. They resemble something else. So here you see ladybird, they look like ladybirds, they look like some other beetles like grass, like a piece of bark, and you can see like twigs, even like dried leaves. And then you get a, a several of them that look like bird droppings. And of course, the chirostras, enormous variation of patterns of the abdomen that you find and that are known as the bark spiders. And there's even some of them that look like sheep. Now, okay, the ability to produce venom. The venom is produced in uh, in the in the in the gland here and released through a small muscle contraction, and the, the venom is released through a small opening at the fan. Here you can see the large fans, for instance, of a baboon spider. All the spiders except one family are venom glands, but Ilburida use a different method of to produce venom to kill their prey. Now, in our research, we have mainly looked with the venom is concerned at biological control and human envenomation. Now, biological control, spiders are predators. They are very common on plants. We have done a lot of work on plants, and they're usually the first group of, of animals that move into plants. They occur in fairly high numbers in crops. They're found in all the micro habitats on crops. The most of the spiders are polyphagous and feed on a variety of prey, and they will feed on the eggs, on the larvae, and the adults. And they have a special, special adaptation for a predatory way of life. They can, for instance, survive a long period without any food. And here you can see they are able really to catch large spiders much larger than themselves. This is one of the Amoxidae, and they are specialist termite feeders. This is some of our research we've done. You can use all the crops, avocado, cotton, BD cotton, nice, that we've done. And it's amazing. If you look here on, co on cotton, there's 172 species that we found on cotton, and on macadamia, 80 species, and on citrus, 197 species. So they're there. The people don't see them, but they really play a very important role because they're there the whole day walking around looking for food. So we have spent a lot of time really to market spiders as the farmers and the gardeners best friend. Here you can see some of the, the articles that have been published. And for instance, new research that have appeared last year, each year about 27 million tons of spiders consume somewhere between 440 to 880 million tons of insects. So spiders are there and they play a very important role in nature. If you look at the venom, I must only mention our 55 years of with spiders, and we have never a confirmed death due to spider bite. Just like a snake bite, you get your neurotoxic affect the nerve system, and cytotoxic affect the tissue around the bite. If you look at the black buttons, we've got six black buttons, and here you can see the distribution. And there's antivenom available for them. And if they bite you, you can become really ill. And usually you need, and, but after you receive the antivenom, you're okay. The brown button, this one has an hourglass underneath the abdomen. This is the one from Zimbabwe. And this is the, um, so this one is the only, you will find it in a few places, but this one, like the Dicusia are found all over the country, and they frequently found around houses and under garden furniture. 
The sex pattern, here again, you can see the distribution. For instance, in Gauteng, you find a lot of them in houses, especially Shanakant and Firkilhaute. We find them, a lot of them, on, on cotton and in, in, in other crops, and handling them, removing them, we realize they can be quite aggressive when you handle them a lot. They are common in the houses, and I found them exactly like retreats the material, active at night, and then they walk around, and then it can happen that you might be given a bite. The, the violent spiders, here you can see also the distribution of mainly two species that are found in houses, in Malima and, and Par Paramia, and they make also a, a, a more a red soil and lesion with a purple center. But even here, it is really not life-threatening. It's only nasty ones. Now, we've only, in the book, there's only 780 species discussed. It's it just too large, too many spiders for one book. So what we've also done is we have pre prepared photo identification guides for all, all the families, all, all the uh, 72 families are not completed yet, but we eventually will, will complete them all. And there we do have, we have two pages for each species, and we provide a lot of information, photos, distribution, complete distribution, everything that we know about the species are completely discussed here. This is free, and the, you can find the link at, here's the link to Zenodo, that people can go and download it directly for them if they are interested. Also, Sansa have a newsletter that they produce every well, four times a year. Anybody interested to le learn more about spiders or uh, to find out what we are doing in South Africa also can from Zenoda download a newsletter for them. But now, thank you. I want to thank everybody, especially that I, we, I was able to do this book, Papa, thank you. And then all the different people, the, the oponymous, for instance, help us a lot. We sampled on the reserves and that provide money for one of the books. The Sun Park allowed us to collect in their parks. And we received our funding as we believe it was three of us were right scientists. And so we, we thank everybody for all the help we get. And then again, I want to thank all the photographers, all the Sunset team members. And all the students that have uh, given their voucher specimens for us, Straight Nature, Papa, Helena, Julian, Nail, Avril, and especially Belinda, that have learned an old lady how to Zoom. My friends and all my family. I hope with this photo here, somebody have learned a little bit and they will, they are less afraid of spiders now. Thank you. Wow, Ansi, thank you so very much. That is a, a huge amount of information and delivered with such passion and, and, and care and knowledge. Thank you so very much for that. Um, I, we have some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'll invite anybody else who hasn't put a question in there now. You are welcome to do that. And we will go across and um, answer some of those questions for you now. Um, okay, the first question from Nicola about the where one can submit photos of spiders and information is needed. I think that is is that covered in the um, in this uh, link that you just provided, or is there somewhere else? Is there is there a, a a resource that somebody can use to submit photographs to UNC? Uh, yeah, yeah, if they want my advice and identification, they need to submit it directly to me. But they, there's also e naturalists that where they can also put their photos and usually the people they will try to identify it for them it all depends how but if if they they welcome i don't mind to id spiders for them but they need to send it then directly to me for that or else put it on e naturalist fantastic thank you um philip has asked does the shield bum spider detach the proppy when he get when it goes into its retreat or is it part of its body it's part of his body. Yeah, I know that that's the whole thing is part of his body. It's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that it, and then that it, it's then the exact size of the hole that it produces. It's, a, it's, a, it's such an anatomical uh, adaptation. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and and you can use it at the top from the outside. And even the burrow is usually different shape. You can move a little bit down, lower down again. But is it really there to protect the, the burrow from anything entering in it? Yeah. Wow. Uh, Tracy has asked how many of South African, how many of the uh, South African spiders are medically significant? Oh, so the only the ones that we know here, it, it is basically the, 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 the black patterns, and then we have bites from sex spiders and violent spiders, and there was some in articles about the six, this uh, the six-eyed crab spider, but we're not sure about that one, mm -hmm. but it's really not so seriously. The, the button spiders is probably the ones that are the most serious because it's a neurotoxic venom that, that can have a problem. But as I say, we have no confirmed, document confirmed cases of deaths. Okay. That we, we definitely know this spider have killed this person. We have that for scorpions, but not for spiders. For spiders. Right. Well, I think Roger, I think that answers your question. He was asking how many are dangerous to humans. So we've we've identified that the, the button spiders and the violins are probably the, the most significant. Yeah, but we usually also tell the children is how many people do you know that have been killed by a spider? Usually none. How many people do you know been killed by a motor car? So actually, motor cars are much more dangerous than spiders. So True relax. Story. <laughs> True story. Um, and then Desiree has asked a very interesting talk. Nice comment there. Thank you, Desiree. And um, do spiders mate only once? Can they lay numerous egg sacs at different times or, uh, or, from, just, or, or from just one mating? You know, there's not, not all, but there's still a lot of behavior that we don't know about. Usually, the more the aronomorphe, they, they grow and then when they shed the lower skin, they adult. And then they and then they usually mate, but the megalomores are, uh, share their skins while they adult, and they can maybe mate more than once. And also, I've seen now the brown button can make about uh, I think something like thirteen different egg sacs. So it all depends. Also, I don't know. I think some of them can even store them the sperm. The female can can store the sperm, and a lot of the egg sacs are sometimes not fertilized. But there's again, the diversity is great, and you need to look at every species or genus uh, individually to see what they really can do. Right. Uh, Tom has asked, where can we get the ebook? If you don't know that, maybe Belinda can type it into the questions and I can answer that if you know where, the, where we can get your ebook from. Or, no, the same um, with the other book. The same, the, the, they sell both book at the same place. It's, it's, yeah, so straight, straight, straight online, straight nature would have both of them online. Great. Right. Um, Mark has asked, what spiders, uh, what happens to the webs of the uh, spiders during the day for the nocturnal spiders? Oh, that, that's very interesting. Some of them recycle them. They really they remove the web and then they eat it. And then they, the, the silk is very quickly available again to make the web at night. Some of them roll it up and drop it to the ground. And there's a long, uh, Alan Jones, for instance, in the free set of silk, a lot of them leave their webs. They, they move out of the web and sit on the vegetation, but leave the web. And, and, and occupy that web again. So there again, is very diverse th between the different genera, what they do. But you can, you, they definitely, some of them roll it up, they remove it and, and they recycle it, they eat it again. Okay, so, that, so just a follow up on that then from my side. So the web, it's not an unlimited source. They can't produce that, but there's a sort of a lead time to, to get back to be able to produce web again. We, we have uh, one of the bark spiders, Chirostris, they're large spiders, and we were doing field work in Bongola, and we have collected one of them at night. We were able to pull silk, 64 men, mantria, men steps. Men, men steps. Yeah, out of the spider, and then, it, then she was empty. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there is a lot, but as I say, it's not, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, enough, for, it's yeah. enough for the spider's needs. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Uh, Philip said, are there sack and violin spiders found in and around Cape Town? 
Yes, he, 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 he was actually looked at that maps there. I especially put the maps there. Mm-hmm. I think the sack spider are not that common in, in, in Cape Town mm-hmm. because Leon Lords have revised the genus and they've looked at all the spiders in all the museums. And we've counted that and looked the ones that are found in houses and they are not that common in, in the Western Cape. They're very common. There was people that come in from Gauteng and they will have catch nine to 10 of the sack spiders in their houses. So they're very common in Gauteng and the Free State, maybe less common in the Western Cape. My aunts, also, there's certain areas in the Free State and the Middleburg in the Eastern Cape, we found the, the violent spiders, but they're not, they're, they're not that common for me. Mm. The, the, the brown button, for instance, is very common. And all over, yeah. Right. Uh, Benson has asked, are the, let me get this right, the Omidoxia now under family Gephimisdode uh, as a genre? Yeah, they're all. I'm butchering those, those names. The, the, the taxonomists move stuff around. They it was Amuxinidae, and now they, then they put it under the Gnophusidae, and we think probably later they're going to move it back to Amuxinidae, like the golden orb web. I talk here and I said the golden orb webs are part of the RNA day, but only last week a new publication, they again the Philly Day. So there's they, they move them around. They're still sorting out the taxonomy, the higher taxonomy of the spider. So the, there is this name changes frequently. Sure. Um, Edmund has an interesting question for his children. He says, can I tell my kids to go ahead and handle, for example, the baboon spiders without worrying about getting bites? You know, spiders can bite. It's a protein. I see frequently at displays that people, for instance, handle the rain spider. And we had a lady working for us and she was bitten by a rain spider and she was allergic to the protein and she landed immediately in hospital. We had to phone the ambulance, she landed in hospital. So be careful, they can bite. If you know what the effect is, like these things, somebody don't, no problem with a bee sting, the other person die. It's a protein. So if you, you must be careful, there can be allergic reaction as we've seen with rain spiders. Mm. And, and I see frequently how children are allowed to handle them. They must be careful only. That's, that's so very something that's that important. can bite. Exactly. What, what, what hurts for one might not hurt for the other. Even, even within, between your, your own family, one child versus the other child may have a different reaction to the protein. Yes. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll, I'm always very careful with that, that you must only be careful. They can bite. And they have a venom and they can bite. Um, Yvonne has an observation. She says she sees much less spider activity in my garden in the winter, uh, the cold weather. What happens to the spiders at this time of year and do they still hunt? You know, a lot of spiders overwinter in different stages. Overseas, for instance, where it's very cold, they usually overwinter in egg sacs, in the egg sac. The egg sacs stay like that. And then after, in the summer, they, they breed that. In South Africa, where it's warmer, a lot of them are Immature. We did a lot of surveys. It's usually surveys over, over long periods of time, and you can see a decline in numbers during the winter. A lot of them are probably immatures, and they sort of crawl deeper into the vegetation, closer to the uh, grass stumps and things like that, where they stay during the winter period. But they definitely decline in winter. But summer now they out here. I think you still got winter in the Cape, but here in South here in Pretoria, it's summer. The spiders are out every evening. You can see all the webs around. Yeah, okay. Uh, Rudy has asked, will you be going to the Afras Colloquium? He's dying to finally meet you. Maybe. I'm, a, I'm in a wheelchair now, I'm old. I'm in a wheelchair, but maybe I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. There we go, Rudy, you can hope. Uh, Corin has an interesting question. Yeah, collecting thousands and thousands of spiders. Are you ever worried that the, a collector may inadvertently collect the last of a particular species after that spider is, is, is extinct? Is that is that a possibility? No. You, you, do you know how many motor the motor cars, Do you know how many spiders are being killed by motor cars? Do you know how many spiders are being killed by birds? 
Yeah, in my garden, they, they kill all my spiders the bit. No, I don't think so. We, we need to collect to be able to tell you the stories. We need to know the species are threatened. And we need to collect him to describe it. A lot of people now, they don't want to kill it. So they take beautiful photos and I tell them, this is a new species. But that's that. You can do nothing with it because you don't have the specimen. You need to describe the specimen before you can say, this is the new species. So sometimes you need to collect to be able to save a species. Got you. Um, Sue has asked, what is the scientific name for the flatty? Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of them. Selenopidae is the family. And then there's two genera, Selenops and Anaeops. And there's a lot of different species there. Right, there we go. So you can yeah. Google that and see what, what you come up with. Uh, Tom, how long do the on how long do the average? I mean, I know there's there's so many different species, but on average, how long do spiders live for? What is their life general lifespan? I, I think the ones that you usually get in and around the houses in here is is probably from nine months to eighteen months, and then you get a group of them that we think are around five years, and then the megalomorphs and the trapdoor spiders can live much longer. Some of them apparently can live to 50 or 20 years. They live much longer, the, the, wow. the more primitive uh, trapdoor and baboon spiders. And then are, is that, are they then similar to sort of uh, lobster and crayfish that they don't have any final size? They just keep on molting, molting, molting as, as long as they can go, or do they eventually get to a final size? No, they get to a final size, yeah, I think so. Usually the wolf spiders, we've done some work on some of the, the wolf spiders, and they usually go, they live about a year, and they go through nine different molds before they're adult. Yeah, and that will probably be the same for, for the baboons. They, they, they live longer, but it will usually take a longer period for them for the next molt yeah no, no not, it's, not, so, it's not like it's not like a molt each year there's not a it, it, it's 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 a it's a, a how is you know, the period there, there also there are so many species and there's almost nothing done on the biology in south africa okay. I, I can't tell you for sure it's amazing and see that uh, that looks like we've come to the end of the questions it's just left for me to thank you once again for sharing your time your passion your knowledge and there's beautiful images for them to all your team and everybody who collects and takes the images for you. I know it's a group effort. Thank you to all of them. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you to everybody who's made it back for the second round and for anybody who joined us for the first time. We look forward to seeing you again uh, in a month's time for our next Wednesday talk. Thank you and have a good rest of the day. Bye, everybody.